I'm Jim Wood. I'm a folk musician, a fiddle player from Williamson County. I grew up in Fairview, Tennessee, which is a little village where Williamson and Hickman and Dixon counties come together. Uh, that's an important part of my story because this area was one of the hotbeds of fiddle music, singing, mandolin, guitar, banjo, uh, that fed the Opry back in the early days of the Opry. So I was very blessed to grow up around uh, the best of the old players who played on the Opry, uh, they were just my neighbors. Uh, top studio players lived in the area, and uh, not the least of which, my dad was a tremendous guitar player, and he played banjo as well. Played in local bands and played uh, jobs and everything. He never played for a living, but uh, he was a tremendous musician. And so uh, that all led eventually to my being the uh, five-time Tennessee State Fiddle Champion and being a professional studio player in Nashville. My being a professional musician, though, is rooted in the fact that I grew up in this incredible folk tradition in the Mid-South here. The area where I grew up of surrounding Nashville is no accident they call Nashville Music City. There's an incredible amount of grassroots music. That's what fed the early Opry and, and uh, became the foundation for the industry in Nashville. These incredible folk traditions, fiddle playing, banjo, mandolin, folk singing, guitar, it's all there. And uh, that was passed on to me from my father and his friends and, the, and my grandfather's generation. And uh, that's what folk music is. Folk music goes from generation to generation, sometimes written down. There are traditions in fiddle music, for instance, uh, that go back hundreds of years of writing tunes down. Sometimes, more often, it's passed just by ear. But uh, it's the idea that you play the music of a community that represents uh, the life of that community. It's uh, rooted in dancing. Fiddle music in particular is very rooted in dancing. And uh, of course, gospel singing, singing in the church, singing in local uh, events. Uh, that's, that's all part of what this process is, the folk music process. As, as you look at it, folk music has key seminal figures who who inject some kind of new creativity and individuality into that tradition. But it's all rooted in the, in the collective experience. My personal story began with my father playing in local bands. So from the time I can remember, I was around little uh, gatherings. Uh, he and some buddies had, a, had converted an old uh, one-room schoolhouse to a, a weekly music venue called the uh, Jingo Jamboree. Jingo is uh, an older name for Fairview. So I grew up around that in people's living rooms, jam sessions, goat ropings, whatever. Okay, there are all these different things that my dad was involved in. So one day, the fiddle started to catch my attention. I've said this before, and, and I'm not the only fiddle player who ever said this. One of the main things that got me interested in the fiddle that caught my attention was the smell of it. I love the smell of the fiddle. The rosin and the varnish, it's, it's, uh, it's just something visceral about it. To this day, I'll just sniff my fiddle. I love it. Okay, so I told my dad, I think I, I would like to play the fiddle. And so his being a musician, he wasted no time in, in uh, bringing home a fiddle for me. And so uh, he was at home uh, from work early one day. I came home from school. And uh, so there he had a fiddle. So I was excited. Of course, my dad played, played guitar and banjo. So he didn't play fiddle, but he knew the fiddle tunes because he played them on the banjo and whatnot. And uh, so that first day that I got a fiddle. My dad, uh, on this particular banjo right here, 
1969 Gibson, uh, he figured out uh, how to play Soldier's Joy. That's the first thing I learned. And um, he picked out the melody. That's the first part, then... second part and so I didn't know which end of the fiddle to blow in didn't even know that music used uh, letter names and there, there were notes or anything this is totally by ear and I got the fiddle and he kind of knew what to do to tune it up and I just moved my fingers around until I was able to copy the sound of his playing that basic melody and then uh, on the banjo it would sound more like <laughs> So that's the first tune I learned. So many years later, my wife and I, we here in Flat Creek, Tennessee, in Bedford County, we hosted Contra Dance. And uh, so we had a group of uh, Danish musicians and dancers that were coming through uh, this part of the country, and they stopped and performed at our uh, local community center. So we were having a jam session the night before the, uh, the dance and the performance. And uh, so we don't even speak the same language. So we're just kind of struggling. So we want to play. So I play, start to play Soldier's Joy. They immediately dive right in. Okay? That's like this music transcends cultures, languages, uh, all philosophies and everything. As a matter of fact, this tune, I have a friend from Denmark who plays fiddle who's told me that uh, there are references to this tune from 800 years ago. So that's just a really cool thing that these, these melodies, uh, they, have a, they have like a genetic makeup. They have a DNA, and, and they're able to transcend all these changes and still remain the same. It's a really cool thing. That day when my dad taught me Soldier Joy, that was my beginning the journey of a lifetime of playing music. It's carried me around the world, but it's all rooted in these experiences I had growing up right there in Fairview. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you a little aside here, okay? Benny Martin, one of the greatest fiddle players, he's one of the twin towers of bluegrass fiddling. He was an Opry star for 12 years. Benny Martin, one of the great fiddle players. The greatest compliment I ever had in my entire life bar none, was uh, one time, uh, he didn't, I didn't know Benny when I was a, a little kid. He got to know me when I was probably late teens or 20. And, uh, and so Benny and I were jamming one time, and Benny is a titan. He's at the, the, on the Mount Rushmore fiddle plan. And Benny's from Sparta, Tennessee. He uh, made his reputation initially with Flatt and Scruggs and then became a star in his own right. Later with John Hartford a lot. Uh, Benny and I were jamming, 
And Benny uh, was playing guitar at that time, even though fiddle was his main thing. He would say, oh, play so-and-so, play so-and-so. So I was playing these tunes, and we were jamming for a while, and Benny said to me, he said, now you've lived right here in Middle Tennessee your whole life, haven't you? And I said, oh, yeah, I have. I said, how'd you know? And he said, I can just feel it when you play. So uh, I have to thank these old guys that, that got me started for that because probably nothing is more important than that, is to play music that speaks to who I am, where I grew up, and, uh, and the whole tradition that I inherited. I'd like to name a few of these guys uh, by name. Vester Terman, fiddle player from right there in Pinewood, the little area where I grew up. As a matter of fact, Pinewood is so small uh, it's so out in the country and everything that uh, they didn't even get electricity into that area until the early 50s. I think the fa first paved road in that part of the county was like in 1957. So we were out in the boonies, even though we weren't that far from Nashville. As a matter of fact, uh, Pinewood Heights Elementary School out there, uh, it, we were so country that this is a true story uh, on the baseball scoreboard at the baseball field it didn't say home and away or home and visitor or their guest or whatever it said them and us so that's how country it was where i grew up so vester terman uh Pee Wee buttry played on the opry for years richard hoffman played on the opry for years benny pewitt was like a granddad to me he played harmonica and guitar benny for instance uh i would often go to his house, he was my granddad's age. I often go to his house after school. I'd ride home with his daughter who lived with him, who was a, a school teacher, and her son uh, was one of my best friends. And uh, Benny would come home from work. We'd go feed the cows and work on the fence or whatnot, and then we would sit down on the porch and, uh, and play tunes. And he played the harmonica, so I grew up so much uh, those initial experiences were just totally by ear. I, I couldn't even watch his fingers because he's playing harmonica, but many of the tunes that I still play to this day, I learned just from hearing Benny's harmonica and all the time he spent with me. Then we'd eat dinner and we'd go and sit by the wood stove in the kitchen and play till it's time to go to bed. So that was a big part of my childhood. His, uh, his nephew, Ed Pewitt, great guitar player, uh, Shorty Mangrum, W.T. Mangrum, these guys played mandolin, guitar, sang, great singers. Sam Leggett uh, played in a band with my dad. Sam actually was uh, the uh, captain of the fire department in Franklin. So dad was all the time going to the fire department to uh, the fire hall to play music. When I was little, I'd just be sliding down the fire pole and that kind of stuff. And then I went from that to playing, playing music with those guys. So uh, Billy Brewer, great fiddle player from one of the best bluegrass bands in the country, Music City Bluegrass, right there in Fairview. And uh, those were just the local guys in my community. So it's an incredible opportunity I had to uh, absorb their music. Jam sessions were a huge part of what was going on. Playing for dances were, uh, was a huge part of what was, where the music lived in that community and for people dancing to it. That's a great uh, part of what the fiddle music tradition is, is playing for dancing. And we were constantly going to jam sessions. When I was uh, 12 years old, I went to my first fiddle contest. My dad found out about fiddle contests, and so we, we uh, I, I don't remember how he found out, but we wound up uh, going to Elizabethtown, Kentucky to a fiddle contest, which was a pretty good trick. And uh, I started meeting my peers, uh, many of whom are some of the best fiddle players on the planet, people about my age. And we had an incredible competition between us, like friendly competition, where we taught each other tunes. So I was learning a whole lot uh, just from my, my peer group. I would learn something, I would teach my friends, my friends would learn tunes that I would learn that from them, hear them playing. And we got to meet the, at these fiddle contests the best of the uh, fiddle players from the previous generations, the elite players. J.T. Perkins, Fraser Moss, Clyde Hartman, Charlie Turner, Roy Crawford, all these people from the Southeast. And then later on, I got to meet people from uh, out in Texas, Benny Thomason, Texas Shorty, uh, Lewis Franklin, Orville Burns from Oklahoma. 
uh, these guys set, uh, set the standard. They were the elite players. And so we would jam at these contests. I would hear those guys compete. I learned to compete against them. They set the bar so high that uh, my age group, uh, we just aspired to try to play and just stay in the same room with these guys. And so uh, these tunes are passed down. There's a lot of cross-pollination, like I said, from different parts of the country. J.T. Perkins was one of my biggest influences. My son is named after J.T. I used to be able to, I was very blessed to be in a situation where I could go stay with J.T. at his home in Arab, Alabama, and, uh, and just be a part of his life and, and learn from him. And so these weren't formal lessons, though. This is just jamming, just hanging out together, and just absorbing these things. And uh, also in the community where I lived, uh, part of the folk music tradition includes uh, the, the fact that I live 30 miles from Nashville, and Buddy Spiker and Hoot Hester, two of the greatest session fiddle players, uh, and who was a great guitar player as well, uh, lived right there in my community. So... I went from playing around in Buddy's yard playing uh, tag with his kids to like, Dad, well, Buddy plays fiddle. Why don't you hang out with him some? So I go over to Buddy's, and I went from being 10 years old uh, and just getting started to eventually you know, making uh, records with Buddy. And, and I went through the full journey from complete beginner to professional studio musician with Buddy. So he had a huge influence on my life. And uh, these guys took me in, showed, showed me everything that they knew, uh, very generous, and, and the, the technical standards you learn from these guys, uh, just what it takes to be the best, from JT, from Clyde, from Buddy, from Hoot, these guys really set the bar high, and uh, that's what I and everybody in my generation aspired to do. The folk music process for me was also, in fact, I had an incredible formal ed education instruction with uh, great classical and jazz uh, players. Uh, Pamela Sixfield, a great classical violinist. She was one of the top uh, string players in the Nashville studio scene. Mark Feldman, world-renowned jazz violinist, lived in Nashville for a while. So I was able to study with these people. Craig Duncan helped me out a whole lot. Uh, one of the... Uh, uh, still works in the Nashville scene. So I benefited. If you were to write a script and you said, okay, in your wildest imagination, don't, don't hold back. Write down what you think should happen if you want to be a fiddle player. And, and, you, and you just wrote down what happened to me as I grew up. That would be the script. That would be your dream experience if you wanted to be a fiddle player. And so I was born at the right place at the right time. And so I have all these people. That's part of the folk process. It's like I have all these people to thank for getting me to where I am. So my benef having been the beneficiary of all this wisdom that's passed on to me, I've taken it seriously. I have a calling to, to pass that on to the next generation. I started teaching when I was 17 years old. So uh, it's a lot of years. I'm 57 now, so for 40 years I've been uh, working with students. Uh, I have been very fortunate to uh, have some great students. I've had 38 different students win uh, either national or state championships. So that's one marker that you can measure success is winning a state championship or a national championship, but uh, more important to me is feeling as though people have been able to use this music and develop themselves on a personal level. It's very transformational, the experience of learning. I know that. I had great teachers, both formal teachers and these people from whom I learned informally, and I've taken that very seriously to, uh, to pass that on to the next generation. I've uh, had cool opportunities working with the Tennessee Arts Commission and their Master Apprentice Program. I was the recipient from uh, Governor uh, Ned McWhorter of the Governor's Award for Preserving uh, Traditions in Tennessee. 
and uh, that's that's all been a blessing. Uh, I'm taking all that experience and all these uh, all the knowledge that I've gained and acquired from all these different uh, wonderful teachers who were role models for me, and uh, my partner Mike Smart and I are now doing the Jim Wood Online Academy of Acoustic Music. Uh, I can only be in one place at one time, so uh, we're making this information available on uh, on the web. But it's a library of all the wisdom that I've gained and acquired from all these different uh, experiences and all these resources in one place where people can go and uh, and learn the authentic real fiddle music uh, from someone who's actually been there and done it. And so uh, that's something I'm, I'm really proud of. It's, it's kind of like my life's work in a way, doing this academy. Uh, and it's something hopefully that will outlive me. For those of you who are aspiring musicians, uh, there, there's one thing about uh, traditional folk music you really have to, to keep in mind. And that is, uh, because people learn kind of informally lots of times, uh, posture is a huge issue, okay? People will learn and they'll, they'll develop bad physical habits, you know, about, you know, bending the wrist backwards or holding things funny. And, and uh, not only does that create a glass ceiling from a uh, mechanical standpoint about your ability to perform at a higher level on the instrument, but you also... Uh, at best, going to reach an age where your technique will start to decline, or what's worse is if you injure yourself. If you practice enough to get good and you're practicing incorrectly, then uh, you cannot be at odds with your body. So posture, having your head above your shoulders, having everything line up right, where the biomechanics are, are working the way that they should, that transcends style. Whether you're a classical violinist, whether you're a bluegrass fiddle player, jazz violin, whatever. It's super important that you learn to listen to your body and not have tension in your body. Keep everything lined up, balance. And uh, if tension is the enemy. So uh, I tell students, you have to relax as if your life depends on it. So uh, if I were to say just one one thing for people who hear this, pay attention to your posture. Get, get uh, the right advice. Get the right instruction so you can learn how to be free to use your body to play the instrument. Because you, you develop a partnership with this instrument, and uh, it will it'll give you great things, but you have to be willing to work with it. Okay, so I would like to say also, uh, learn the basic melodies first before trying to do anything fancy. Okay, for instance, uh, one of the all-time great fiddle tunes, Sally Gooden. Um, the basic melody, uh, a lot of these fiddle tunes, by the way, uh, they're dance tunes, but they have little uh, verses people will sing. Had a piece of pie, had a piece of pudding, gave it all away to see Sally Gooden. So that's just the basic melody, if you play that. Same way that I learned the basic melody of Soldier Joy from my dad, who was able to pluck it out on the banjo. So learn the basic melodies first. That's that way you're you're acquiring real knowledge of the thing that makes that tune what it is. And then you you're playing at a technical level you can manage, so you're not gonna struggle and develop bad habits. You get where you can jam with people and play out in the world as quickly as you can if you're playing just simple, basic melodies. And then there's time, there's a lifetime. I've been playing Sally Gooden since I was 10 years old and I'm still working on it. And I'll be working on it till the day I die. There's, there's a lifetime to develop things and make things fancier, but start with the basics, get that good solid foundation. And that way, as you develop your own style and you come up with your own variations and you you work with tunes and you, your style evolves, it'll be on a firm foundation. 
of knowing that basic melody. So John Hartford used to call Sally Gidden, for instance, the cast iron tune because that basic melody is so strong, it's almost as if you can't tear it up. So basic tunes, you, you develop. I'll give you an example. Okay, so that basic melody. Okay, you can put a little fancier bowing to it. Sounds a little more fiddly like that. Okay, and start to add double stops where I'm playing more than one note at a time. So things get more and more uh, uh, sophisticated. There's another little variation. But throughout all that here, da 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 da. So basically, um, just in general, you're not doing variations well if you can't tell what the tune is, that basic melody. Spanish, you can't just learn Spanish from reading a book about Spanish or even uh, getting some interactive uh, program on a computer or learn language on tapes. Whatnot. You have to learn the words, you have to know what the words mean, know how to put them together, and you have to get out and speak Spanish with people who speak Spanish if you want to learn how to speak Spanish. And so it's the same for folk music. This doesn't, it's not a pursuit it's going to come to fruition if you just stay in your room and don't get out into the world. And uh, that's kind of like the payoff. Uh, it's like practicing on a basketball team but not getting to play in the game. No, you want to play in the game. You know, you put the work in, you run the laps, you do the drills. You want to be able to get in the game, and that's where you really learn how to play. So, and that's the fun. That's the payoff, you know, to be able to to get out there and, and do it in the real world and, and uh, develop the relationships and you hear yourself in relationship to what what the other musicians are doing and how you're blending in and, and you just, it's a, it's a non-linear kind of process, but uh, you, you develop those skills just from real life experience. I have been very fortunate to get to share much of my musical journey for the last, uh, gosh, 26 years with my wife, Inge. She plays guitar, and amongst other things, and we play together uh, quite often. 
James, my son, plays bass. Angela, my daughter, plays percussion. She's also a buck dancer. Uh, I'm very proud of her. She won the uh, the uh, Tennessee State Buck Dancing Championship when she was little. So uh, it's been a real blessing to be able to share my music with my family, something where we can have fun and uh, hopefully inspire other families to get to do things together like that. And so uh, it's not anything I take for granted, the opportunity to do that. So if you were to go central Kentucky, western Kentucky a little bit, down through middle Tennessee, and for those who aren't familiar with Tennessee, we have three stars on the state flag, east Tennessee, middle Tennessee, and west Tennessee. So it's really almost like three states in a way. So central Kentucky, middle Tennessee, and north Alabama, going down towards Huntsville and Athens and everything, there's an incredible tradition there's a lot of continuity stylistically musically and everything the way this region uh works and that most of these musicians are from that area west tennessee not so much fiddle music or really anything they have blues over there and some uh, incredible guitar and, and vocal traditions east tennessee you're getting over into the appalachian traditions which are really different from middle tennessee but uh if you look at the rivers Tennessee River Valley, uh, Tennessee Valley, going down from Knoxville down in northern Alabama. Kind of, the Tennessee River kind of cuts cuts out middle Tennessee. Then the Cumberland River going through Nashville. Benny Martin actually is the guy who coined the term uh, Music City USA. It's no accident that all these influences coming down the Appalachian range uh, all these settlers brought their music there's confluence of the black influence from the deep south the scots irish the german the french it all kind of came together right here in this region of uh, middle tennessee north alabama and central kentucky uh, it gave birth to country music basically as we know it uh bluegrass uh, the great fiddle styles also it's all it's always been a crossroads cultural crossroads so Influence of jazz has always been a big part of the fiddle tradition. Influence of uh, some Cajun, those Cajun guys from Louisiana would come up to Nashville to work and play. And uh, the blues influence from Mississippi and, and Alabama. So 
all this is kind of flowing together into this area where I grew up. So I was, like I said, I was born at the right place at the right time. So uh, I should say also that some people have misconceptions about the folk tradition. It's certainly influenced by what's happening with commercial music. You know, fiddle players since the 20s have been buying the records of other fiddle players and learning tunes. So going all the way back to the 20s when this all began uh, with, uh, with the beginning of uh, record technology, uh, there's been a, a lot of cross-pollination, tunes coming in from West Virginia, Eastern Kentucky, and then they kind of get their own uh, treatment here in Middle Tennessee. Tunes coming up from Texas, from Missouri, uh, up from Alabama. So, like I said, the, the cross-pollination of these different styles was greatly facilitated by uh, radio and records. Okay, so uh, some people have a misconception about what uh, traditional folk music is, and they think, okay, you're playing just the way your granddad did back up some hall or someplace. What I learned, the tradition here in Middle Tennessee is... Uh, it's open season. Go to a jam session with these guys, the, er the earliest guys with whom I jam, Clyde Hartman, you know, uh, Charlie Turner, Fraser Moss. Fraser Moss, for instance, he, he won the um, National All-Time Fiddlers Championship uh, back in the late 60s, early 70s. He also played uh, jazz piano in a dance band. So Hoot Hester, he and I used to have a duo. We would play everything from Bill Monroe stuff to Bob Will stuff to jazz standards, Western swing. We'd play Irish and Scottish fiddle tunes. We would do all these even in a show. So any jam session. Uh, Dale Potter, for instance, the guy who taught me, I, I should have mentioned Dale earlier, the guy who taught me how to hold the bow and the fiddle was one of the most revolutionary fiddle players who ever lived. Dale Potter uh, sent shockwaves through the fiddle world in the 50s that we still feel. So uh, fortunately, I met... I met Dale through uh, Buddy Spiker, and like I said, I was kind of holding things. I was a little uh, out of whack there. Dale's guy got me straightened out about even how to hold the bow and the fiddle. So Dale would play jazz, western swing, bluegrass. He worked with everybody from Bill Monroe and, and uh, Mac Wiseman to, to making jazz records. So at any jam session... Uh, anywhere I grew up and all the guys I knew, it was open season, like I said. You could you could uh, start out with Irish fiddle tunes that, like I said, we interpret them a certain kind of way. It doesn't sound as if we're playing in Ireland someplace. Play those tunes all the way to uh, Duke Ellington pieces. So uh, the folk music tradition is, like I said, not just uh, old tunes that somebody learn from his granddad or something. It's, it's all this. So the folk music process is continually reinventing itself. It can't be vital if it doesn't represent the different uh, experiences and influences of people who are playing it now. So uh, one of the great things about the tradition that I learned from all these old guys is don't be closed-minded. Everything, everything is cool if it's done well. I should say at this point a, a special word about uh, a man who had a huge, huge influence on my life. Not just musically, but just in every way. He was like a second father to me. His name was John Hartford. So Hartford, of course, is famous uh, for his being the, uh, the folk music icon, popular music guy who wrote Gentle on My Mind and was on network television with Glenn Campbell and all that kind of stuff. But the John Hartford I knew was the, the passionate old-time music, um, I, I mean, lover, practitioner, uh, everything you could say. He was an amateur in the true sense of what the word amateur means. He just 
live for it. He loved it. And of course, the fact that he's incredibly talented and had uh, such a profound influence on the music scene in general. Uh, I got to experience that firsthand, John, and I said, like I said, John and I spent a tremendous amount of time together, not just playing music, but just living life. So John and I kind of made it our mission. John described himself as a closet librarian. Well, we made it our mission to go around and archive different uh, uh, music from different fiddle players. We'd go to Monk Scruggs' house. We'd go to, to we go hang out with Fraser Moss. We would, we would go and, and jam with these guys, go down to JT's house. And we'd jam with these guys, and John was a... Uh, uh, he was a collector as well, so he always had his uh, tape recorders, and uh, we would transcribe these tunes later. And so, uh, as a matter of fact, the, something I did that was uh, one of the most valuable things in my experience as a, as a fiddle player, John and I cut an a album of uh, duets of tunes that we, nearly everything on the album is something we learned from uh, these guys in Williamson, Dixon, and Hickman County. And uh, just banjo fiddle duets. And uh, another part of the folk process is what John and I did. We just played together a ton. And we got to where we were just one mind. So I would do a little something. He'd pick up on that. I would respond to what he did. It's just this dialogue. And uh, we do write tunes down in order to communicate ideas and archive things and stuff. But ultimately, it's an... It's a spontaneous improvisational kind of uh, situation where there's give and take. Another thing I learned from John is to embrace your role in this, in this continuum. So we have the old guys that we revere and we learn from these guys. John told me, for instance, one time he was, he was an avid uh, Earl Scruggs fan. So... In the 50s, when he discovered banjo and Earl Scruggs was on top of the world, uh, John played fiddle and banjo both, by the way. But uh, talking about banjo, he said he wanted to play just like Earl Scruggs. So he learned all Earl Scruggs records, uh, uh, licks off the records and everything. He said he got to the point where he wore his hair the same as Earl, wore the same shoes as Earl. He just wanted to be Earl Scruggs. So he got to meet Earl Scruggs in the, in the mid-50s. He just drove up unannounced to Earl's house. Earl was very gracious, invited him in. He got to know Earl, and they later become best friends. And uh, he said he realized at a certain point that if he wanted to be like Earl, he needed to do what Earl did, which was to be himself. Because that was the power of Earl Scruggs. The genius that he was, it wasn't that he was just copying something. He took all this material, assimilated it, and put his own stamp on it in, in this uh, creative eruption. He developed what we call bluegrass banjo. So John said, well, I, what am I going to do? Be Earl Scruggs? No, Earl Scruggs already is Earl Scruggs. So he said the most important lesson he learned was to be himself. And that's one of the most important lessons I learned from John Hartford is to be myself. So John really fostered that kind of creativity in people, encouraged people to be themselves. And so it's important to see yourself in that continuum of the great players, and, and you take that, and then you add something to that, and then the next generation will learn from you, and it just gets passed on from generation to generation. And uh, like I said, in the broader sense, folk music uh, doesn't, isn't just limited to what we would call, you know, traditional country music or fiddle music or whatnot. That process can be found in jazz and uh, classical music. I mean, people learn from the previous generations and it's passed on. Uh, I do differentiate between folk music and commercial music sometimes when sometimes if in the Nashville music machinery, it is true that some music is produced solely for economic reasons. And uh, they, they, have, uh, they, do, uh, they do market studies, and they say, we need this kind of song right here because we think it will sell well. And uh, that's one of the main reasons I left being a studio musician in Nashville in 1999 is uh, 
uh, I was 30, what, 34 years old, 35, I was 35, and I had just um, done that enough. It was kind of, that, that kind of environment can become toxic sometimes when everything, when something is done just for money. So that, I think that's an important distinction to say uh, folk music is made by people for other people, for themselves, and uh, yes, you want it to have some commercial viability if you're trying to make a living, but that doesn't mean you have to compromise the music. Music that's created solely for commercial um, ends, just to make money, it just doesn't feed my soul. I need, I need to feel as though that I'm doing something that has a spiritual dimension to it and that challenges me intellectually and technically and uh, that can inspire uh, people to, to learn from what I'm doing and, and, or just enjoy what I'm doing. Uh, I do believe that people playing music, folk music, be it in Bulgaria on a whistle or like bluegrass banjo or whatever, that it has the ability to transform a community. It has the ability to make the world a better place. I've often said, maybe somewhat facetiously, but somewhat seriously, if everybody in the world played music, it would solve most of the world's problems. I can't imagine the kind of spirit that it takes to learn how to play the fiddle or the accordion or whatever, that being the same person that, that wants to do that, being someone who would act violently towards someone else or start a war or be uh, their damaged society through greed or... I just I can't imagine that folk music has the ability to make the world a better place. And like I said, that's in the broadest sense. If you're a jazz saxophone player or a bluegrass fiddle player, it's that, it's that idea that you're part of that community. And, uh, and also it takes uh, to play the music we play, unlike classical music, where uh, you know, we have to improvise playing traditional field music and that kind of thing and react to one another. It's the ultimate... Um, Democracy, I have my ideas, you have your ideas, and we make those things work together. Uh, it's a, also a, a meritocracy. It's like you get in a fiddle contest, it's like the work you put into it, you get rewarded for that. And uh, not everybody needs to be a fiddle champion. Uh, fiddle music, the, the fiddle ecosystem needs beginners, it needs just amateurs who play just for fun, it needs serious amateurs, it needs professionals, it needs teachers, it needs students. All of this is it's, it's part of this ocean, great ocean of, of music that we share with one another. So for me, to sum it up about what I would say about folk music, is that it communicates something that's spiritual. It's, it's what, it's, it says what makes us human. I'd like to end with uh, a story about Benny Pewitt, okay? Benny, of course, uh, I lived on Pewitt Road. His uh, grandfather and his grandfather's brother back in the 1800s had, had come out to that part of Williamson County and just kind of carved a place out of the woods for themselves and made a life and raised families. And so Benny's house was a log cabin that had other rooms built around it. So the original house went all the way back to his granddad. And uh, it was old. And uh, when Benny's granddad planted a maple tree in the front yard when he first built that house back in the late 1800s, he put this metal band, it was like huge, like enormous, metal band about this thick, this big around, and it did not have a seam. So it was seamless, and he put that band on the ground around where he planted that maple tree. And the maple tree grew up there, and then years later, you know, generations later, this huge big maple tree, you, you pick that band up and you could pick it up off the ground and look and you it's like, how did that get there? So 
that was Benny's granddad's sense of humor. It's like he did that for generations to come where they would just get a kick out of that. Okay? Benny inherited that sense of humor. He had this kind of uh, cackle, this kind of twinkle in his eye, even when he was in his late 80s. And uh, had this incredible sense of humor and this, this whimsical kind of way of, uh, way of communicating with people. So, Benny, unfortunately, uh, uh, contracted Parkinson's disease. So, one day, before Benny got so bad that he couldn't talk or stand up or anything, I, I went over to visit with Benny regularly. And uh, one fall day in October, I was over visiting with Benny. So I was leaned up, and he was leaned up against the fender of the car there. And it was this beautiful fall day, and it's ideal weather. And this uh, this big maple tree was bright orange. And so Benny and I were talking about the maple tree, and of course I knew the story. And we were just kind of laughing about his granddad and the whole thing about the maple tree. And right in the middle of a sentence. Benny was speaking about the maple tree, and he diddly, 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 diddly. He started what we call deedling, kind of like humming the tune Mississippi Sawyer, just right in the middle of the sentence. And he said, what is that tune? He said, gosh, that's like my favorite fiddle tune, and I, my mind is, is uh, not working. I can't even think of the name of that. And I said, well, that's Mississippi Sawyer. He said, oh, yeah. And, and so he went on, and we continued talking about the maple tree. But in an instant, I had this epiphany, like this road to Damascus experience where the light, you know, the light comes. And when he was talking, then he went into deedling. The, the intonation of his voice and the, 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 the accent, everything, it was all the same when he was deedling that tune from the sound of his voice. And in a flash... I realized that okay, he was deedling the way he talked, and he played the harmonica the way he deedled, and I played the fiddle the way he played the harmonica. I put those same accents in there and everything. I just in a flash realized, wow, I play the fiddle the way Benny talked. Gosh, that's so powerful. And uh to think about the fact that Benny spoke with the same accent as his dad and his granddad. Just think about these men who, who had the courage just to make a life for themselves. And, and uh, to me, that's what it's all about. It's powerful. And uh, like I said, I was born at the right place at the right time to have people like that in my life. He took me in and showed me the way. And uh, the music to me is, is all about that. So I can say that uh, the folk music that I inherited uh, here in Middle Tennessee from my, uh, from my forebears, ancestors, the people who knew me, from records and in person and everything, it's been more than just something to do for fun. It's been, it's been uh, more than just an opportunity to participate in a community. It's been more than the way that I've had a livelihood and made my living and had a great life. It's been more than the thing that carried me around the world, getting to play in different parts of the world and share my music in different countries. It's, it's been the thing that allowed me to find myself and to develop uh, spiritually and emotionally and intellectually. And it's, uh, it's given me my life. So that's how powerful folk music can be. Mm -hmm.